Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is a sword from Swords of Northshire. And uh, well, it's been a long time since I said I would make a review on this video. Well, not necessarily that long, but I've been waiting for a good opportunity to actually cut with this sword. And one hasn't come up. It's been bitter cold on the weekends, and any time I seem to have spare time to actually swing a sword around, uh, it's just not really in the cards for me weather wise, at least not when it comes to cutting. So, this review is going to be more or less on the aesthetics. You'll get to see me swinging it around a little bit. I can give you my thoughts on the dynamics and how it's held up over the last couple months in terms of just general use, but I haven't cut anything with it yet. So, this isn't going to be a complete review. I'll have to hold off until the destructive testing and things like that though right now a lot of people do just draw their sword and use it for Eido and don't necessarily cut anything with it so I can give you my thoughts on the overall construction and that type of stuff which uh, which is what we're gonna do with this video so bear in mind there will be a part two and when it's when it's less than 20 below zero or 15 below zero or five below zero when it's warmer I will get around to actually making that part before I get into the meat of the review, there are some things I want you to know, disclaimers if you will, that I should put at the beginning because they may influence how you perceive the things that I'm about to say, at least if you're watching this video with sound on and not on mute, which I suspect many people do. Uh, anyway, the point is that this is a sword from Swords of Northshire that was sent to me for the purposes of review and I don't have to pay for it, it's a review sample. Some sword friends out there actually asked me my thoughts enough for me to reach out to Swords of Northshire and request a review sample. They obliged by letting me pick and choose uh, some things from their customization options so that I could share them with you. So I didn't pay for this. You should know that going up front. Uh, also, you should know that I did pick and choose the parts that went on it. So at least in a general thematic sense, if you don't like the way it looks, then that's probably more on me than on Swords of Northshire. Uh, I over bedazzled this sword really intentionally to, to share all the different customization options that I could on one sword. So it's a little over embellished if you ask me. It didn't come together too bad, but uh, overall it's a little over zazzed, if you will, just so I can show a lot of different options. Additionally, you should know I'm not uh, affiliated with Swords of Northshire other than they sent me this sword for review. I'm not being paid to do it, and I'm not an expert either. I'm a guy that likes swords. I'm an enthusiast. I, I know a couple things, and I'm happy that I can share them with you, uh, but I am not an expert, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Those are the general disclaimers. The next bit I'm going to tell you is that this sword is $475 or $474.99. Uh, but in a nutshell, this is really a $290 sword. It's all the additional customization options that I put on it that make it more expensive. And I'll put a breakdown in the description down below. But the basic gist is that this is not a terribly expensive sword at the get-go. That extra $185 isn't all the little accoutrement bedazzlements and extra bits and bobs that I had added onto the sword. So what does that $185 get you? Well, that's, I suppose, the point of doing this customization over embellished piece, is that you can see uh, what if it's worth over bedazzling your sword, or at least what customization options Swords of Northshire has. I wouldn't expect that most people would have as many different types of adornments done on one sword as I have here, but it's entirely possible you would, and hopefully we'll get a chance to see if it's worth your money. The first bit I'm going to talk about here is the Kashra, the end cap, the pommel right here. Uh, this bit, this middle cap at the end of the handle. And the thing I'm going to note about them in terms of main criticism is something that's going to flow through pretty much all of the fittings on this sword. And bear in mind that my expectations are tempered given the price point of the sword, but uh, it's still worth noting that the details on here are just fuzzy. It's, it's the casting quality isn't great. I can make out imperfections aside from the very kind of muddied or, or softened or subtle details that, uh, that are on here. Not subtle, just, uh, it looks like a, a mold that's been cast too many times, if you will, and the details are just not as crisp as they could be. And that seems to be consistent on the Manuki and on the Fuchi. The soup is a little different. It looks like a water jet cutout piece, so rather than cast. But uh, in any case, the details are just not great. And there are little imperfections in the casting that I can make out apart from the, the kind of muddy details. And those seem to be... Uh, consistent across the theme of the sword. Now, again, it's not a terribly expensive sword, but there are swords out there, like pieces from Hanway, that have a lot crisper details in the casting quality of the sword, and if that's something that's important to you, then it's worth noting. Now, there are a variety of options that you can choose from to put on a custom sword on Swords of Northshire, but all of them looked a little, little muddy. I don't know if they're all a little muddy, but this is what I have to show you in terms of example, which is pretty consistent. Many sword forges don't have terribly crisp fittings. It's still a point worth noting because some, some do. The other bit to note is the transitions between the Ito and the, the Kashra here, and it's it's kind of bunched up towards the end, and it's not great. Now, I don't feel ledges. The Kashra isn't loose. It doesn't wiggle around, and the Ito hasn't come off from around the area, but the end knots are 
movable with my fingers under some amount of pressure. And again, this is after I've used the sword some, uh, so that's not necessarily a great sign in terms of the overall expected longevity of the Ito wrap. But uh, anyway, my hands didn't get caught on the Kashra. Overall, it was comfortable to use and it didn't come off. Let's move on to the handle, the ska, and starting with the Ito. It's supposed to be a black silk Ito, and I believe it's made of some sort of synthetic type. It's also begun to fray quite a bit. Uh, now, I've used this over the last couple months, or since I got the sword anyway, and I've been practicing EI with it as I have time, and the, the Ito has begun to fray. It's also loosened ever so slightly. It's not a, what I would call terribly loose or concerning at the moment, but I am a little concerned that when I start cutting and I have some pretty severe impacts, uh, that this Ito will loosen up even more. Right now, I would say it's not at the most desirable level, but it is sufficient. Underneath the kind of silkish Ito is a uh, full Samegawa wrap. Now I was able to verify that this is in fact a full Samegawa wrap. It is a small nodule Samegawa. So apart from the fact that it's a full wrap, there's really nothing terribly remarkable about it. I don't necessarily expect there to be really, I mean, a really nice skin of something like, oh, it can cost over $200 by itself. I'm not expecting it to be overly embellished or zazzy, though some swords at this price point do still have uh, larger nodules of Samagawa. Uh, most of the time, this is a suggestion here. If you're going to get a small nodule Samagawa, a lot of those details get obscured if you have it lacquered. So if you do a, a colored Samagawa underneath, um, the small nodules seem to be less prevalent. So if you're, if you're going to uh, have a sword project done, that may be a suggestion for you. I went with the kind of classical white, and uh, I can make out the nodules, they're just not, not necessarily remarkable. Also, the handle came off reasonably well, which means I can tell you a little bit about the Nikago. It has a signature on it. I would describe this Nikago as not terribly detailed. It doesn't have all of the file markings that some of the other swords in this price category might have. Namely, Hanwei tends to put a little bit more emphasis on, on some of their Nakago options. Not always, but in many of their swords, it's a little prettier. In this case, it's uh, got a signature, the engraving or the, the name carving on it is, is a little uh, crisper than I would say I've seen on other swords, but there's really not a whole lot to mention on the Nakago. It's not the best done, but it's not supposed to be for $300. As I noted when I spoke about the Kashra, the Minuki on here are just a little muddy. It's a floral pattern Minuki, but it's difficult for me to tell you that without kind of knowing and having seen the Minuki and knowing that I picked out floral versions. Just by looking at them, they, they kind of look a little odd and it's tough to, to make out any detail about what they're supposed to be. And that brings us to the Fuchi, and the Fuchi has the same issues that I would have noted with the Kashra. There are also some more ledges here. Now, where the Ito bunched up around the Kashra, the Fuchi, it doesn't, and there are some ledges, though none of them really bite into my hands or are uncomfortable uh, when using. I don't notice the ledges, but I can make them out as I look at them or feel them with my fingers. Ideally, this is a better fit, and there aren't any ledges poking out around the Fuchi. Uh, in this case, they're very minor, but still, they shouldn't be there at all. In terms of sepa, we have a simple brass sepa here. Uh, it's got some detailing on it, but it's pretty much the standard sepa that you see on most production swords. Let's talk about the suba. The suba is a water jet cut out steel type suba. And one thing I noted is I picked this cherry blossom theme, mostly because I didn't see a Mitsudome theme. But the main point was that this cherry blossom theme is uh, got some little sharp points on it that could be really uncomfortable if you rub your knuckles on them. Now that said, they've been rounded in such a way that I have not found discomfort. I've, I've kind of rubbed my fingers on them or choked up uh, bringing my hand really close to where the suba is intentionally and I didn't experience any discomfort. It didn't bite into my hands. Uh, which is which is the tip of my head. A lot of times these have been extremely sharp on other swords, and in this case, it's not. It still maintains some of that really sharpened detail, but it's it's rounded enough that it doesn't bite into my fingers. Now, thematically, this is a cherry blossom suba. It matches overall, but it's a little crisper than the Fuchi Kashra Minuki. Uh, it's not bad though. Thematically, it blends. Next, we can talk about the habaki. And the thing to note about this habaki is it's a pretty plain Jane you know, run-of-the-mill brass habaki that you see on just about every sword, but they have the option of bedazzling the habaki with a moan or some sort of engraving, and which naturally you can see I put twirly mitzodomes on it. And so what I would say is that this adds a, a little bit of detail. It, it looks a little confused as we uh, look at the etching on the blade, which we'll talk about in a moment, but at the same time, I like that you could maybe etch your dojo emblem or your initials or some particular thing. I asked for a mitzodome, you could put whatever you want on the habaki, and I like that they're able to add that level of detail. We'll move on to the Saya. Now, the Saya aesthetically is a cherry blossom with an additional 
bedazzled mitzodome in the Saya. And overall, the execution isn't necessarily so bad in terms of aesthetics. Uh, the hand painting on the cherry blossoms and the mitzodome actually add a little character. I can kind of make out the brush strokes, but uh, overall, I, I kind of actually like that more than I expected to. But there are some downsides to the Saya, namely the function. So it's really, really tight. I have to really push to get the habaki to loosen up and it really hasn't loosened up all that much over the last month of using it i thought it would loosen more but it just it really uh it really hasn't there's also not really a conventional koiguchi again at this price i'm not necessarily expecting the world here but uh it could be it could be a better uh mouth opening side I, I don't know if this is just a plastic resin around it or if it's horn but in any case it doesn't have kind of the the ideal structure of a of a saya mouth opening it also trans it, the Koiguchi also transitions from the Fuchi a little weird. It kind of steps down or slopes in or is sanded in such a way that the transition is just a little more jarring than it needs to be. It's not the best execution of the, the Saya opening that I've seen. The Saya actually also arrived cracked. Now, that's not something I'm actually going to ping Swords of the Northshire for. Uh, for one main reason. One, they offered to replace it even though this sword was free. They offered to send me another one, but I, I think that this Saya is going to do the job in terms of me showing you some of the features that are available uh, but two when it got here it was like 20 below zero outside and i actually shipped out a couple other swords that week and i had cracked size as well that that cold was really bitter uh, so coming coming from wherever this came in china presumably warmer than the arctic tundra that i happen to live in and uh and so it cracked the saya which is which is not great but they still offered to replace it and i when i talked to swords of Northshire, they said that would be the case that if it was a saya that could be replaced that they would do that for a customer so in terms of service you know things happen it's how how a vendor stands behind their product that matters and they offered to send me a replacement saya which is which is pretty cool the saya also came with this segeo and the shittadome on the the saya those are the little pieces that you see attached to the saya here uh, basically just fell out immediately and what happens is they just scratch on the saya and ding things up so it's either better to not have them or to get them stuck in right away i mean i could epoxy them or something like that but anyway they're just sitting here scratching the saya the segeo is long enough pretty enough but it's frayed pretty easily it's not the highest quality segeo though again you don't expect necessarily the world for the price you paid it does the job of being a a Sageo and, and doing what it's supposed to be doing. The spacing of the Kurigata as well is a little further down than it necessarily needs to be uh, by maybe about an inch. I haven't necessarily found it to be problematic in terms of finding in my Obi, but it is a little little further down the side than I, I might expect. My main gripe with the side is really the, the draw. It hasn't loosened up and it's really kind of odd to, to get in sometimes. It has some kind of binding noises that I've noticed some rattling. Um, it does the job. Again, it's a really long sword as well. I ordered custom length, so maybe the, the curvature, the length, any number of those things uh, might impact it. But I, I have noticed that it's just not, not the easiest to do uh, drawing practice with, especially this, this opening here, which just has not loosened up. And that makes me think something is uh, binding internally and, and causing a pressure which, which, isn't, which isn't loosening up with usage. The other, I suppose, nice thing, though, is it doesn't rattle. So if it's binding, uh, the uh, one positive side effect might be that it isn't, it doesn't rattle around as you move, and it certainly doesn't fall out. Now we're going to move on to the blade, and one thing I want to show you on the blade first is this little engraving. Now, it's not actually an engraving, an etching, and it's uh, just a little cherry blossom theme. It's an etching uh, that, uh, that Swords of Northshire offers. It does have a texture, though, so it tends to gather wood a little bit, so it's, it doesn't always look as pretty as it could. But honestly, I like this little cherry blossom theme. This little engraving adds just a little bit. It's also really dark in terms of black, and it, it, it kind of meshes well with the, with the rest of the handle. Artistically, or aesthetically speaking, I, I like it more than I really thought I would. And the cherry blossom tree just kind of sticking out from the habaki actually came together better, better than I thought it would. And anyway, they have uh, several different etching options, and, uh, and this happens to be one of them, so you can see some execution. Uh, Bryce at Thread the Northshire sent me a photo of what it would look like, and it happens to look really pretty much exactly like this. So it, it came out quite well. I like the way it dips into the bohi. Overall, I'm, I'm actually pretty pleased with the, the little etching that's on the sword. Aesthetically, it, it has, you know, for a little bedazzlement, it's pretty cool. Now, one thing I asked for on this sword is I gave them very specific measurements in terms of the width and the thickness and the length and 
all of that. I also asked for something unconventional. I asked for one side of the sword to have a bohi and a sohi, or one large bohi and a smaller one that runs underneath where that ridge typically would be. And then on the other side, I asked to have a single bohi that started an inch above the habaki. Now, I actually asked for a, a different style bohi than this on the other side, uh, and I, I don't think that was necessarily super clear by the email that I sent, and it, I didn't bother clarifying it when... Uh, when Bryce had sent me photos or asked for follow-up, because realistically this does the job that I needed to do. I wasn't necessarily going for something particularly weird. I just wanted two examples of different bohi to show you how they execute on, on these two bohi. And overall what I'd say is that it ripples and it's not great and it's far from perfect, but for the amount of money that this sword is, it's, it's there and it's cool and it was a really odd request and they, they did it. Which, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I can't expect perfection at this amount of money, um, and for what it is, it is what I asked for, and it's it's quirky. But I think it's really cool looking. I like Bohi and Sohi. If you're looking for that kind of thing, it, it does add an element of, of interest and coolness that you don't necessarily see. There are ripples in the Bohi and imperfections and things like that, and I'm also not terribly enthusiastic about how the Bohi begin or terminate. The, the edges are not necessarily super crisp, uh, but they... They aren't the worst either. I've seen swords that just kind of fade off into nothing, and these at least have some intentional point of termination. It's just not terribly well executed. Now this is also a uh, 1095 sword, just a through hardened blade, and the hamon has been etched on. It's not a real hamon. I asked for two different pattern of hamon as well. So you notice that one side is a is a more conventional type of pattern, and the other side is a little bit more erratic. And that was intentional. I wanted to see two different examples of the hamons, and you can see one being very even, one being a little more odd. It's uh, it's it's interesting, and again, a very odd request. I'm sure um, not a lot of people necessarily do that, but it it definitely did the job. In terms of the polish on the blade, it's almost a mirror polish. It's not quite. It's it's a couple steps down from a mirror, but. Uh, that seems to be the overall impression. This is a through hardened blade, so there's no natural hamon to show. It has two different options on the hamon. One, one side is one, and the other is a different hamon. This again was intentional. I wanted to show you two different examples of a hamon and kind of what Swords of Northshire's execution looks like on those examples, just like I did with the Bohi. Again, an odd request, but they facilitated it. Uh, the Kasaki is there. You know, it emulates what uh, what a Kasaki should look like, but it's it's certainly not a uh, you know awesomely done, super burnished, amazing polish, but you're not expecting that. Now, a lot of the swords that I see out there don't necessarily look as nice as this for, for the money. This is a $300 or $500 sword, depending on the bedazzlements that you choose. And uh, and overall, for the money, uh, through hardened blades aren't necessarily as shiny and pretty as this. Overall, I, I think aesthetically, this is a pretty looking blade for a through hardened sword. Now I'm going to talk about the dynamics of the sword, and before I do note that I will put the dimensions as well as a link to the Weapon Dynamics computer in the description down below, so you can see that there. I did do quite a bit of EI with it, or at least practice for a while with this sword, and uh, it's a light, lively little sword, which is kind of what I was shooting for. I wanted something lighter to, to tinker around with, and one way that Swords of Northshire achieved that is from the range of dimensions that I provided, they kind of gave me the minimum. That allowed them to use a more standard size habaki without making it look really weird or making a specific habaki, uh, and they were able to, to do what I wanted, but it was on the, the smallest side of the range of, of dimensions that I, that I asked them to meet, which they did. They gave me what I asked for. The result is a very lively, nimble sword for a 30-inch blade and a 12-inch handle. This is, this is overall a, a pretty uh, lively-feeling sword in the hand. It moves around. It's easy enough to to do EI with for a long blade. Again, it's a lot of times if I'm using like a 25 or a 26 inch blade, it's easier for me to move around. A blade that's 30 inches long um, is not, not conventionally a lively, fun experience for me to move around and do some of the one-handed kata or to, to hold the sword with one hand. Now, as soon as I have two hands on it, it's, it's obviously kind of a, not really an important point. The sword can weigh five pounds and it's easier to move around with two hands. But the uh, with one hand, this sword kind of is, is easy to do a lot of these motions with. It also has this unconventional bohi, which may aid in the uh, the way it sounds. It makes a hasuji or this um, tachikaze, I can't remember which one is which, but it makes the sword wing swingy noise pretty easily. The main point is that this sword is light and lively and 
comfortable to move around, at least for its size, especially in this size. Swords tend to be really cumbersome to move around, and, you know, they throw my shoulders out, and they're uncomfortable and such. And this isn't. I asked for something light dimensionally. That's kind of what was going to gonna have to happen, and they executed on it, which I think is great. So that brings me to what do I think about the sword? Is it worth $500? Should you go buy one? And, and frankly, I can't answer that question yet. And the reason is I haven't cut anything. Cutting with at least katanas is a pretty important of how katanas be katanas. And I haven't gotten a chance to really do that, so I can't, I can't tell you. Um, stay tuned for part two where I do that. I'm going to go through some destructive testing. We'll do some cutting. I'll tell you how I, I feel about the cutting. And then we'll, we'll break it and I'll, I'll tell you what I think about how long it held up. But until I do that, I really can't, at least until I do some cutting, I can't tell you what my, my end final thoughts are on this particular sword. What I will say is there are, is one big thing that I like and two things that give me some concerns. So we'll start with the concerns first. One, this Ito has just loosened up more than I think is acceptable. Um, it, it moves around without a whole lot of pressure, uh, at least on kind of where the, the crosses are, um, where they overlap. Uh, that's not that's not great. Now, it wasn't super tight when I got it, but it was tighter than it is. It's also fraying, um, and I haven't done really anything too rigorous or arduous with the sword yet. So it does give me some concern that that is going to be something that degrades more than is acceptable when I actually get around to cutting things. My hope is that as I cut things, uh, that it holds up in well into the things that it should normally cut and, and hopefully pass that. Um, I'm not expecting that to be the case, though, with what I'm feeling right now. I think it'll loosen up more than more than is ideal. Anyway, that's one thing I have my eye on right now. It's fine. It doesn't give me any pause to use. And if it maintains this level of, of tightness or maybe even only loosen slightly, I think that'll be fine given the price point. The other bit to note is that the Koiguchi area, this area on the sword, the mouth, the opening of the side, is still extremely tight. And I think it might be a binding issue. It kind of starts to feel like it gains tension here. And then it requires a lot of pressure to put in. So what this does is two things. One, as you're pushing, you kind of really have to push with your thumb to get it out. And then you have to quickly pull that thumb back as you draw and kind of explode out. Otherwise, your thumb may not be there when you when you do no to and put the sword away. And that's where I actually cut myself. There's bits of dried blood on the suba and on the on the Isaiah right now. Um, I was doing no-to and I actually recorded this and somehow I deleted the video. Um, not intentionally. I'm not afraid of showing you my failures. Uh, I publish them on YouTube all the time. The point is, though, that I was putting it away, and it just doesn't sit in the Koiguchi uh, as, as comfortably as it could, and I, I glanced my thumb or something in there, and I, I cut my thumb open. And this was while I was doing Noto, not while I was drawing it out, and it's just it's just not, not super great. It's still very tight, and I've tried kind of banging the Saya together to get this to loosen up, and it just it really hasn't made any difference. It's still as tight as I remember it it being. There are other things like a crack Saya and these loose Shiridome, but that seems par for the course for most of these swords. Uh, this, as well as the loose Ito, I think are the parts that are really performance inhibiting or that give me uh, more pause as I think about if, if it's worth it or not. At a glance though, for $289 for a base model or a super bedazzled one like this, that's the, the thing that I think is actually pretty cool. Now the base model is one thing, it doesn't, it's not necessarily terribly special. There's a lot of sword companies that offer decent swords for 300 bucks and getting to pick and customize one, I suppose, is one very unique thing. But the real strength here is all of the goofiness that I asked for and the fact that they executed on it. I gave them a sheet with some very specific measurements. They went within those measurements. I asked for specific fittings. The order I got was what I wanted. Communication was really good. And it's just the fact that I ordered something really specific and, and got it. So if you're a person that cares for having little embellishments, maybe you want your initials, maybe you want uh, some some writing, maybe you want maybe you want whatever, maybe you want whatever bedazzlements. If those are important for you for ceremonial aesthetic or whatever purposes, the fact that you can get them in a sword that's under 500 bucks is pretty cool. Uh, it's not just you know that I got to pick the fittings. I got to pick some pretty unique and different things. I also got to pick some pretty odd geometry bohe type flare things on the sword, which change around how it sounds, how it moves in my hand, and if those are things that are important to you, uh, I think it's really awesome that you can actually achieve that in a sword that's 500 bucks. So, uh, so far, that part is really cool. It is also very sharp. I know that from left-hand experience. 
waka waka. Anyway, uh, so far it does have some really notable good things going for it, but I just, I can't tell you if it's good or bad or right or wrong or if it holds up or not until I actually get into cutting things. So stay tuned for that. I hope to have it up in the next month or two. Um, it depends on, on what the good old Polar Vortex has in store for me. In any case, that's what I have for you today. I hope it's been interesting. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.